Well, welcome. Want to welcome our satellites. Uh, so excited for those groups that are starting up. We uh, have many around the city. Uh, one in San Diego today that's starting, and that's kind of fun. So love that. Just love that people are getting to dive into God's Word together and um, thankful for that. If you have a Bible, would you turn to Exodus chapter 3? And uh, we're going to dive into this passage. Let me pray. Father, I do just invite your spirit to be our teacher. I invite you to come. I pray, Lord, that you do that thing that you do, where you speak to us as a group, and yet you amazingly you speak to us individually, and you have something for each woman who's in this room. And I thank you for that. And I pray that they hear your voice through your word this morning. In Jesus' name. Last week we uh, started in Exodus uh, chapters 1 and 2 and we asked the question that really the author was putting before us. And that question was a question of um, where are you God? Where are you God? And this week, what we see is we see God showing up. We see God showing up, and that's what we're going to look at uh, in Exodus 3, starting in verse 1. It says, Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, which is also called Mount Sinai in other places, the mountain of God. Now we have to remember a few things about Moses, right? some things we saw last week, that Moses was a Hebrew baby. He was an Israelite. You'll see that interchanged in Exodus, Hebrew, Israelite. He was a Hebrew baby who um, was doomed to death, but was uh, put into the Nile and rescued there by none other than Pharaoh's daughter and her people, right? And so Moses has this amazing... Um, history. He's, he's rescued by Pharaoh, Pharaoh's daughter, and Pharaoh's the one who wanted him dead, wanted all the baby boys uh, dead. And so he grows up in Pharaoh's household. He grows up in Pharaoh's court, and but he has an awareness that he is Hebrew, that he is an Israelite. He actually was raised at, for a season by his mom. He was able to go sent back to his mother uh, to be raised and then into Pharaoh's court. And somewhere along the way, he seemed to have the idea, he seemed to get the concept that he, there was something unique for him, that he was going to rescue or help or serve his people, right? And so remember this because this is so, um, I, I relate to this so much. So here's Moses. He's probably at the time about 40, so he's no spring chicken. And, um, and I think he's kind of been waiting. I'm a Hebrew. I'm an Israelite. I've raised up in Pharaoh's court. I've had all this, you know, good education and all these things. And surely my God of the Israelites is going to use me. And so he kind of just steps out ahead of God and tries to help, Right. He's determined that he's been chosen. Something's going to go down. And so he sees um, an Egyptian abusing a Israelite, a Hebrew. And so he steps in and he ends up killing the Egyptian, right? Well, it doesn't all go as Moses intended. Again, even his Hebrew brothers are kind of disturbed by him and are like, what are you going to do to me? Are you going to kill me too? So he takes off, he flees, he heads into uh, Midian, and he's there for 40 more years, okay? And he obviously goes there because he's hiding from this crime of murder, but I think he's also hiding from something else. He's hiding from shame, right? He's hiding from not getting it right. And now we find him and he's a shepherd 
And it's interesting that the author lets us know he's not even a shepherd of his own flock. Right. He's, it's his father-in-law's flock. How embarrassing, right? He can't even get his own sheep. And to add salt to the wound, because he was raised in that Pharaoh's household, he was raised in the Egyptian uh, court, if you will, he would know, and I think he would feel this, Egyptians despised shepherds. It was the lowest of low. If you're going to do anything, you do not want to be a shepherd. So here's Moses. He's hiding. It's been 40 years. He thought he was going to be something, and he's nobody. He's a shepherd who's kind of walked his father-in-law's sheep probably four or five days out to get them something to chew on or whatever it is. And he's got this despised profession. And this is the piece I want you to hear. This is the piece that is a theme that runs uh, really throughout the scripture in so many other people's lives. And I think it has probably happened in your life, some of your lives as well. Moses is not looking for God. That's important here. Moses is not looking for God, but God is looking for him. God is looking for him. So it goes on, verse 2, there the angel of the Lord, and we don't have time to unpack the, this concept of the angel of the Lord. The angel of the Lord is mentioned about 67 times in the scripture, and always this language is really, um, in some ways, best understood as that the appearance of God, that God himself, Yahweh himself has shown up, right? So the angel of the Lord appeared to Moses in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it didn't burn up. So Moses thought, I'll go over and I'll see this strange sight. I love the way God captures our attention. For us, it's usually a stranger, weirder circumstance and something much more mundane. Moses got the burning bush thing, which was pretty cool. So he, he, he sees this and he says, this is a strange sight. Um, why, why does this bush not burn up? And when the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush. I love this. He knew his name. He knows our name. And he says, Moses, Moses. And Moses says, here I am. God says, do not come any closer. Take off your sandals for the place where you're standing is holy ground. And then God said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And at this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. God shows up. He shows up big. And he shows up holy. God is holy. Where God is, there is holiness. And this is what I want to talk about this morning. I want to talk about holiness. Because there is no understanding of God apart from holiness. And hear this. There is no understanding of grace apart from holiness. You see, we want to separate those two things. And we want to go, well, there's grace. This is a church that's really into grace. And this is a church that's really into holiness. No. There is no understanding of of grace apart from holiness. There is no understanding of who I am and what I was made for apart from holiness. There is no understanding of your identity apart from holiness. And so I want to say three things about holiness. The first is this. God's holiness is everything. God's holiness is everything. Pastor and author Sam Storm says it this way, and you kind of have to hang with his quote, but he says, the holiness of God only secondarily 
refers to his moral purity and his righteous character. What he's saying is, um, we think of holiness, and it is purity, it is righteousness, it is all of that, but that's not only what it is. It primarily, Storm says, it, holiness of God primarily points to his infinite otherness. Okay, this is deep. To say that God is holy is to say that he is transi transcendentally separate. Holiness is not one attribute among many. Everything about God is holy. Each attribute partakes of his divine holiness. Everything about God is holy. Jerry Bridges, who wrote a book that I read in college that no one would read today, called Pursuit of Holiness. Who's going to buy that book? We bought, yeah, well, the, the three of us who read it in 1980. Um, we like books today that are in pr pursuit of me, in pursuit of my identity, in pursuit of this. But Jerry Bridges wrote this book, and it actually was profoundly impactful to me as a college student. But Jerry Bridges wrote this book, The Pursuit of Holiness, and he says this, holiness is the perfection of all of God's attributes. Holiness is the perfection of all of God's attributes. His power is holy power. His mercy is holy mercy. His wisdom is holy wisdom. We could go on, we could say, His grace is holy grace. His justice is holy justice. His wrath is holy wrath. His love is holy love. His holiness defines everything. You with me? And his holiness elicits praise. This is what Moses would later write in Exodus chapter 15. Moses writes a hymn, and in that hymn, he declares this. He says, who is like you, O Lord? Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glorious deeds, doing wonders? Who is like you, majestic in holiness? God's holiness is everything. Second thing I want to say about holiness. We were made for holiness. This is what you were created for. You see, we tend to, we tend to just think there's, that holiness is so out here. But it's actually what we were created for. If we go back to Genesis and we go back to the creation, it tells us this. You see, Sinclair Ferguson, theologian, he says God's holiness means he is separate from sin. Friends, we were not created for sin. We think that our humanity is defined by our sin. Our humanity is defined by our holiness. We were not created as sinners. Remember, again, you go back to Genesis and humanity, man and women, were created in the image of God, right? We were created in God's image and God's image is an image of holiness. To be like God is to be holy. Holiness is wholeness. You want to be whole? Everybody wants to be whole. Everybody wants to know their identity. Everyone wants to be true to themselves. You want to be true to yourself? Be holy. But here's the problem. We can't be holy on our own, right? Because again in Genesis, this thing entered the world. We call it sin. It's a basically, it's a turning from God. It's a lack of faith. It's putting our trust in self. One philosopher said it's a bent inwardness. 
Tim Keller says that sin is putting our identity and our trust and our value and finding our worth in anything apart from God. And the consequence of this sin is a separation. This is the problem. And if we don't understand this problem, then we don't understand ourselves. The problem is that there was a consequence to the sin. And the consequence was a separation. It's why God um, put man and woman outside of the garden and he set a guard. because, And in some ways it was protective of them because they could not handle the holiness that they were created for. They could not handle the creation the holiness of God that they had been enjoying prior to their sin. Remember, prior to their sin, they talked with God. They walked with God. Holiness with holiness. But sin and holiness cannot coexist. Now, God remained present. God did not leave humanity but there was a barrier, there was a separation. And that's what God is even doing here with Moses, right? Moses is looking over toward him and, and God calls out, don't get any closer. Don't get any closer, this is holy ground. And Moses, understanding, he hides his face. He's afraid to look at God. Because his understanding was that those who saw God would die. We long for holiness. We were made for it. But here's the problem with sin. Sin corrupts our thinking. Sin corrupts everything. Sin creates chaos. Sin wants to divert our attention from what is important to what is not so important. Sin makes things that are lesser seem greater and what is greater seem lesser. And so here's what we do when we encounter the holiness of God. I'm sure there's other things, but three things came to my mind, is that what we tend to do when we encounter the holiness of God is one of the things that I think we tend to do, especially in the church, is we start to pretend. You see, we recognize that God is holy. Who would want a God that wasn't holy, right? We, we recognize that he is pure and he is righteous. And so we get into this presence of this God who is holy and what we do is we just start to pretend. I'm holy too. We put on pretend holiness, right? You ever do this? I remember I used to say this. <laughs> um, and I, find, I, I hear people say it. It's so funny how we're trying to, rather than when we encounter the holiness of God, for some reason, what I want to cling to is my own holiness. I want to make sure you know I'm okay, so we say things like this. I used to say things like this. You know, before I became a Christian, I did this or I was this. But, you know, I wasn't that bad. And people will say, well, oftentimes they'll, they'll be sharing their story of how they came to faith in Christ. You know, I really wasn't that bad. Or they actually tell me of everything awesome they are, right? Which, great, you are awesome. You probably are awesome. You've done great things, right? But we're, now we're just pretending. The other option is we either pretend or we diminish God's holiness, right? We reduce it to something kind of unimportant, really, that, that his holiness is, is not the biggest thing, right? We, we, what we do is we kind of reduce God to something that is manageable for us. We reduce God to a God who feels comfortable to us. We really like God to be kind of a puffball of love, right? We say things like, well, I mean, I, 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 we, those people, they put that emphasis on whole, I'm a grace person, I'm a grace person. But as I mentioned earlier, I don't think you can be a grace person without the holiness of God. But we either pretend or we diminish or we do what the first humans did when they were confronted 
with the holiness of God now from a sinful state. They hid. And we just hide. We just hide. We run from God. We run away from God. And friends, it's easy. You can even be hiding right here in the church. Because church for you is part of your pretending, right? Church is part of your adding to your checkbox just in case there is some kind of God and there is some kind of, whew, keep all my ducks in a row, right? You know, I'll check my church box, but it had nothing to do with an encounter with the living God. And so I want to suggest to you that the only real option when we encounter the holiness of God is the option Peter took. I love this. Peter, remember, he's one of Jesus' disciples. Well, this is early on in their relationship and their friendship. And uh, Jesus is teaching. He's a rabbi and he's teaching and he needs, he's got kind of the people are pressing up against him and all that kind of stuff. And so they're along the shoreline. And so he jumps in Peter's boat and ask Peter if he'll kind of push it out a little bit so that Jesus can teach from... He's, he's probably got a little introvert in him. He doesn't want everyone right in his space. And so he's going to teach from the boat. And, um, and, and so he's teaching from Peter's boat. And, and Peter's hearing his teaching. A teaching that's different than any other re- rabbi. There's a holiness. Again, he's having an encounter and experience. The presence of holiness right there with him. Jesus is God in the flesh. And then... Jesus says to Peter, um, after he's done teaching, hey, you know, because Peter um, is a fisherman, so I think Jesus is kind of like, hey, you know, you blessed me, I'll bless you. Let's do. I mean, it's not transactional, but anyway, that's, I might have just taken you down a bad theology path. But anyway, but, but Jesus is kind of like, okay, hey, um, why don't you, he does want to bless him. So, hey, why don't you drop your nets over here and uh, you're going to get some fish. And Peter is like, uh, you're a rabbi, I'm a fisherman. Let's stay in our lanes, Jesus, stay in our lanes. We were fishing all night, which you probably don't understand, that actually it's better to fish at night and all that kind of thing, and all morning. Uh, we didn't catch anything, and this is a horrible time to fish. But, Peter being, you know, uh, but I love you, and I'm impressed by your teaching, so I'm going to put the net down, but probably not so much is going to happen here, Jesus, just FYI. And sure enough, of course, he puts the net down. And what does it do? It gets filled with fish. It says in the scripture that to the point that the nets were beginning to break. And what does Peter do? Because this is holiness on display. This is perfection. This is a God who knows exactly where to drop a net. This is a God who can speak a word and fish are jumping into a net. This is holiness. This is righteousness. And this is what Peter says. He says, go away from me. Go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. That's a good answer. Because you see what happens when we say what is true That's what Peter was doing. He was saying what was true. He was just saying what was true. I'm broken. I'm not holy. You are holy. I'm sinful. Get away from me. But when we say what is true, what the image that came to mind for me was Narnia. It's that moment when the snow begins to melt. Because in Narnia, the snow and the winter represented death. And the wages of sin is death. But when we say what is true, the snow begins to melt. The curse begins to reverse. When we say what is true, There is now room for true grace to actually do its work. 
You see, sometimes we're just leaning into the word grace, to grace that sounds nice, to grace that sounds good. But what, what, what we really want is we want real grace. We want a grace that transforms us. We want a grace that changes us. We want a grace that invades us in such a way that we are made what we were made to be. We are made holy. That's what grace does. It makes us holy. When we say what is true, the holiness of God is no longer a cause to be afraid but it is an invitation of faith. It's no longer a cause to be afraid, but it is an invitation of faith. Because remember, it is God who comes to you. It is God who comes to me. Jesus came to Peter. Peter wasn't saying, Jesus, use my boat, use my boat. Hey, hey, hey. Jesus came to Peter. God came to Moses. And God comes down to rescue Israel. Verse 7 in Exodus 3, the Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers. And I'm concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to do what to rescue i have come down i have come down i have come down it is the uniqueness of christianity that we have a god who does not say come up we do not have a god who says jump through these things do these seven steps get to this place and you will arrive at me we have a God who says, I have come down. I will do the rescuing. I will rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and I will bring them out to that land that is good and spacious, a land flowing with milk and honey, ultimately a land of holiness. The third thing I want us to hear about holiness is really more of this invitation. Listen for the call of holiness. Listen for the call of holiness. We have to go back to verse 4. This is one of the, the things that most stunned me in my preparation time and in my study. In verse 4, the first thing that God did was he called to Moses, but he did it in a unique way. He said, Moses, Moses. Now the readers of this time, because uh, would understand this, we don't necessarily understand it, but in ancient Semitic culture, addressing somebody by saying their name twice was a way of expressing endearment. It was a way of expressing uh, Actually, a couple of the commentaries use this language. Uh, affection and friendship. So Moses would have known immediately that this voice out of this burning bush was inviting him to affection, to friendship. It, it was a, expressing endearment, right? But then it was God, and, and he didn't know. I don't know. I, I'm not supposed to look on him. But here's what's beautiful. The holiness of God is not harsh. This is what you need to know about holiness. The holiness of God is not harsh. We think holiness, mean, wrath God, grace, loving, puffball God. But remember, it is holy grace, and it is gracious holiness. God's holiness can never be separated from anything that he does. And his holiness is not harsh. It is full of affection and friendship. 
All Moses had to do was to turn and to look. Later, it's interesting to me, Moses would describe God as a consuming fire. And I might be making a leap here, so um, I'm just saying that. I might be making a, a leap. But I, I found this interesting, again, as I was just praying through this passage, that there's this bush, and it was on fire, but it was not destroyed. And I just had this picture of that's what the work of Jesus is like. Because of Jesus, because of Jesus, we can have an encounter with God. And we can be consumed by the holy presence of God and yet not be destroyed. Jesus is the visible image of the invisible God, the scripture says. And we are not invited to look away from him. We are invited to look right at him. Because of Jesus, because of Jesus, that holiness of God can surround us, consume us but not destroy us. Peter, that fisherman, remember him? He would later write so much. If you read his two letters in the New Testament, he seems actually to be intrigued with the holiness of God. He speaks of the holiness of God multiple times in his writing. He writes this, For Christ is also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. The righteous, the holy one, for the unholy one, to bring you to God that you might become holy. That's who we are, and Peter talks about this. We are a royal priesthood. We are holy. So because of Jesus, we don't have to look away in fear, we can come near. And so I just want to invite you, even this morning, would you allow the holiness of God to consume you, to redefine you? Your definition, if you are in Christ, if you have allowed him to come and rescue you, if you have made him your Lord, your Savior, your King, your God, he has begun to reverse the curse. He has rescued you. He has put you in Christ. And you are no longer defined as a sinner. You are defined as holy. You are defined as what you were made for. Live in your holiness. Live in your wholeness. Lord, we receive that. And I pray for anyone here, Lord, who has never surrendered themselves to you, who has been, who have maybe been on a treadmill of trying harder, of striving more. And they just, this morning even, they just need to let you rescue them. They need to let you come after them. I pray. If that's you, I just pray you just would, would, you would just receive that. You would just receive God's rescue. And those who have been rescued, who have placed your faith, your trust in Jesus, uh, would you embrace the holiness that he has covered you with? That when he put his spirit in you, his spirit is the Holy Spirit. Holiness lives in you. 
holiness lives in me. Oh God, forgive us for settling for so much less. We thank you. We thank you that we don't have to pretend holiness. We don't have to diminish holiness. We can just live in holiness, your holiness in us and us in you. In Jesus' name, amen.